Alrighty folks, so let's try to do the impossible here in the city with all this crazy background noise. Let's sit down here and uh, see if we can do the uh, second part of vital pulp therapy following the AE position paper here. I've decided instead of doing this in the office where any sane person would be doing this where things are quiet, but to come here now in the park on the way back home to uh, talk now about some of the kind of background information that you really need to know about phytopulp therapy, some of the pulp biology behind it. I've done one uh, video on pulp biology before in front of my screen, which was kind of uh, very popular. But this time we're gonna try to go with the technology and sit here, kind of draw this for you. Essentially what we're trying to do with this vital pulp therapy paper is to try to see what is the most minimally invasive endodontic therapy that we can do. And in order to do that, I'd like to coin a term here called customized endodontic. And what that means is that it comes from customized medicine, obviously, and it's going moving on from the idea of having specific rules that apply to all kinds of cases, that that's what we have to do. But rather what we need to do moving forward based on this paper and what allows us to do is to really customize the treatment not only just based on every case but also based on every tooth every pulp and every root in a given tooth <laughs> The idea of doing this outside here in the field was not the best. Let's do the rest of this video indoors. All right, so let's sit down here inside a little bit quieter than the mayhem outside and talk about the rest of this uh, uh, concept on vital pulp therapy. What we're going to talk about is as to the progression of caries and then I'm going to make a comparison as to how that resembles almost the progression of pulpal disease. So let's just quickly start to draw here. I'm going to let's draw a little maxillary molar for example and we got this situation okay and a distal curve and then let's just quickly draw the pulp there we go all right okay so from what we know from cariology the moment that we have a break in these early caries uh, progression has kind of changed from early to large caries and our advanced caries and the moment we start to break into from the enamel due to persistence of the kind of acidic insult from attachment of a biofilm from a plaque and demineralization, you end up getting the bacteria from decay getting into the dentinal junction. From here, we know we have our dental tubules that are uh, basically uh, remnant tracks from the odontoblasts formation of the dentin, the way it's tracked down. So you have, if you're just gonna magnify this little area here, what you have is you have your dental tubules, which we know are th the thinnest of the DJ, and then they start getting thicker here as they go close to the pulp, and you have your odontal blast here, like that, and it's sending its projection inside the dental tubule. So as caries gets past the enamel into the DEJ, the dental tubules, as because they are tubular and they're laid down by the odontal blasts and the odontal blastic processes are present in these tubules that move halfway or so up, the byproducts of these microbial activity and metabolism are then released into these tubules and they kind of, through the fusion, move upstream towards the pulp. And although there is a natural stream of the interstitial fluid, which is the fluid that's present inside the dental tubules, outward through an outward flow and certain kind of a flushing of the dental tubules that is triggered by the intrapulpal pressure, over time you end up getting some gradient and this material will diffuse towards the odontal blast and towards the pulp. Now, the presence of these microbial byproducts is then recognized by these pathogen pattern recognition receptors that are present on the surface of odontal blast and odontal processes. So once the odontal blast realizes that 
there is a bacterial by byproduct present into the dental tubules, it will release and do a couple of things. It will first release up the stream into the dental tubules in the surrounding area a certain number of antimicrobial peptides called the HBD1 and HBD2 peptides and these peptides are antimicrobial and they go on and their job is essentially to provide antimicrobial milieu around this area. So it's a form of a defense system, a natural defense system by the odontal blasts themselves to ward off the microbes. Now if you could at this point end up having arrested caries in these incipient decay by trying to do, I don't know, some type of a even silver uh, difluoride treatment or some way to arrest the decay, then you will be okay. But most of the time, patients, due to their own procrastination, continue to have this decay persist and proceed. And these uh, pathogen pattern recognition receptors, which is uh, toll-like receptors on odontal blasts, once they're activated, like receptor 4 and 2, for example, they will also create and release a certain amount of chemokines. And these chemokines are released by the odontal blast. Their activity is to kind of mount a stronger immune reaction. For example, such as interleukins and so on that are released IL-8 and also some of the HBD2 factors are activating the local cells such as the dendritic cells. And these cells in, in turn will release additional chemokines that will then bring in through chemotactic uh, reactions, bring in some of the monocytes and uh, activate some of the macrophages and neutrophils that come into the area. So you end up getting some acute inflammation and that you end up having an inflamed pulp. So at that point, that inflamed pulp, which is a byproduct of these microbial activity that's been triggered by the odontal blast, is going to create some clinical symptoms, maybe not at the very early stage. So it has to reach a certain kind of a somatic threshold in which the patient's starting to have cold sensitivity and so on. And as decay kind of keeps progressing, moving from a uh, peripheral towards the center of the pulp and it gets closer and closer. While this is not exactly fully clear and might be a little controversial, once you get to a certain proximity of the pulp, and some research has shown that once you get close to a half a millimeter of the pulp in this uh, sense, that you are actually having physical microbes entering the pulp. It's no longer just microbial byproducts, but you're actually having the physical microbes get into the pulp. At that point, you end up having acute inflammatory reactions and you could make the argument and that again is a little bit nebulous at this point that that's the threshold in which what we have historically called a reversible and irreversible pulpitis takes place which historically we used to say once you end up having these foci of necrosis which is once the microbes get into the pulp the all of a sudden you have the neutrophil attack of those cells that creates necrosis because as the neutrophils come in and they release their byproducts it creates tissue necrosis and that's really the essence of inflammation you create a little bit of necrosis and that then the macrophages come in and they clean that up here once we've had historically that point of necrosis those little foci of necrosis kind of been moving away from the area of reversible to irreversible as the pulp proper has become inflamed it's no longer an a delta activity now you have c nerve fibers and you have heat sensitivity you have prolonged uh, sensitivity lingering response and so on and as I've mentioned before in the previous video what happens at this point we've said okay you need to do root canal therapy now the new understanding based on some of the research is that well you do have local perhaps necrosis but this necrosis much like the way dentin itself goes through caries the progression of caries from early caries to you know moderate to advanced caries results into layers of caries going from you know that leathery dentin that's fully infected and so on and what we used to call affected dentin although now even affected dentin seems to be a term that is being replaced because even affected dentin is is, is carious it has microbes in it and then you end up having hard normal dentin the same thing is happening in the pulp because you will end up having an area of uh, necrosis which is then surrounded with an area of inflammation of you know acute inflammation and then that grades down to an area in which you have normal pulp so this normal pulp that is remaining would be the equivalent of having sound dentin. So when you do cariology you want to remove your your caries and you want to go into 
uninfected clean dentin before you finish uh, and place your restoration. That's the same idea now with the pulp. So what you're doing is you're supposed to remove the infected pulp and the inflamed, which is like the affected dentin, which really should be removed theoretically. And then you get down to the clean pulp. And as I mentioned in the previous video, we would ideally want to be using some type of a marker to figure out where that clean pulp or normal pulp stars, but we are using a proxy such as bleeding at the present time since we don't have any of those markers that we could use, such as matrix metalloproteinases. If we could have a chair side assay that we could quickly find out, that would be very helpful, but we don't have that, so therefore we're going to use the bleeding as a uh, form. So, all of a sudden, what does this mean? First of all, on a theoretical side, this all sounds nice and clean and, and beautiful. But what I've found many of the challenges of clinical practice is implementing theoretical ideas into practice. And that's partially a limitation of us as human beings and the theoretical realm being at the level of cellular and molecular level. But operations are at a macroscopic level, which we are operating and doing things. So that's where the AAE's position paper's recommendation for the use of the microscope is very handy. So if you're going to do vital pulp therapy properly, you really need to have a microscope so you can find out based on direct visual observation, high magnification, where does the good pulp start? That is a significant part of the equation. And I think what we're going to find out now is whether what people have done in these experimental uh, clinical situations in the academic centers where they've had very high success rate with vital pulp therapy necessarily translate in the average clinical practice and the results they would be getting as well. Because clearly the main stumbling block in this particular technique is the complete removal of all decay at the expense of even getting pulpal exposure and then removing the uh, inflamed and infected and as well as inflamed pulp and then go up to the level of the normal pulp and then at that point you would be restoring the pulp. So you are essentially trying to remove here this area of the pulp until you end up with, you know, you remove obviously the decay as well. Uh, there we go, and everything that's in here. So let's say we just remove all of that. And now you're left with this type of a, with this down here, and let's say down here. And now what you would be doing is you would need to put, let's say you managed to get your uh, hemostasis at this point. Now what you need to do is you need to place something very, very biocompatible. And as I mentioned in the previous uh, video, the uh, recommended materials right now are the um, calcium silicate based cements because these are the most biocompatible. And for those, you could use MTA. The problem with MTA, however, is just you get staining and it's difficult to handle. You could use biodentine. Biodentine has, uh, would work as well. It's a calcium carbonate, calcium silicate based material. It requires trituration. Or you could use the self setting pre-mixed biceramics such as the biceramic BC line of uh, products. Um, so then once you place that, then you need to put a liner on top of that. So you have the biceramic followed by the placement of a liner. And here what you could do is you could use your uh, BC liner. And I think BC liner would be a great choice for any of those if you're using MTA or the biodentine or obviously clearly the BC putty, which has been, this thing has been designed to work with. And then you can place your final restoration on top of that by etching and bonding the BC liner and then placing the rest of the restoration on top of it. Now, if you are concerned that this may not work, but what you can do is you can place the BC putty uh, against the pulp and then you just fill up in bulk with the BC liner. And what happens here is just the, the, the benefit of this is just that it's very quick and uh, it allows you to then give the patient eight weeks so the patient can go home and come back in eight weeks and you can figure out if the case worked, does it require root canal therapy or can you then restore it. And if, if everything is good, then what you would be doing at this point, it, you would then remove, and if you use the blue BC liner, that would be ideal because that would be very nice to visualize. You can remove the, some of the BC liner here. And now what you have, you use the rest of it as base, and then you proceed to place your final restorative material, which would be your 
composite, if you will, or whatever material you want to use, as your final restorative material. And so the, that technique of using the BC liner all the way as a bulk fill just allows you to do your vital pulp therapy very quickly by placing, getting in there, getting to the pulp where you get coagulation, and then placing a layer of the uh, putty uh, or biceramic, and then fill the rest of it in bulk with the BC liner and wait six to eight weeks and see how the patient fares before you invest additional time to place the final restoration. But you have the choice of placing a thin layer of the liner as well. So let's not get too much into the details there. The point of the paper is that, that just describe some of the research that's already been known. But the importance of the paper is that it allows to be present now a legal framework to legitimize the use of these procedures in clinical cases. But as usual, the most important part of your success is going to be based on your diagnostic skills so that you don't do this on cases in which you have uh, first and foremost a tooth that is too far gone if you will and then you don't remove enough and you leave pockets of necrotic tissue behind. You should always remove decay completely in these types of cases. There's no reason to leave any decay behind. So in a sense, this technique is like from a karyology debate. There's some people who believe in kind of arresting the decay and some people believe in removing all the decay. It's two different debates. The silver uh, fluoride uh, people want to leave some of the decay behind and arrest it. These other people, this group believes in complete removal and the removal of the pulp and so on as well. So they're not really comparable, but I just wanted to kind of bring that up. That's essentially it, but the key here that I think is, is a point that should not be lost is the strategic value of the tooth is very important because if you have a tooth that is vital, what we know from the plethora of outcome studies that have been done in endodontics over the past 60, 70 years is that there is only one common denominator in all of these outcome studies and it is that necrotic cases don't fare as well as vital cases. So vital pulp therapy should really come with the caveat that once the case fails then and the tooth is necrotic and that's how you find out that your case didn't work then unfortunately the success rate of the full pulpectomy and root canal therapy would also be slightly lower than if you had done the full pulpectomy and root canal therapy at the beginning in this type of vital cases. So it does create this dilemma in which you are taking a chance to avoid full pulpectomy and you're doing partial pulpectomy, but at the same time you're also taking a chance that you could end up in necrosis which will then affect the prognosis of pulpectomy. That is a dilemma that you're going to be facing in these cases and that's part of the reason why I think the most important thing to do is to go back to what I've talked in a previous video about the future of endodontics on customized endodontics which means that like anything else in life an astute clinician will not make decisions that are come as a rule and that you would be using your clinical knowledge your foundational understanding of what it is that you do clinically the service you render to patients and then apply that not to just any patient but to a given tooth and even more importantly to a given root in a given tooth in a given patient, the strategic value of that tooth, of that root, and what's involved, what are the risks, are all of the decisions you're gonna to need to understand and to mitigate the risks involved in making a proper decision for that given patient. And to from that, I'd like to also add a, com uh, a comment and coin a term here, which is something I believe in, which is the idea of, of root sparing procedures. And what root sparing procedures are in my case, and I've done a few of those that I will over time be sharing these cases with you in future videos, is understanding the risk value of doing a full pulpectomy on a given root compared to, let's say, on a multi-rooted tooth, you may decide that a given root may have too much risk to do full pulpectomy on where procedural errors are possible, and in which case that root may be a good candidate for doing vital pulp therapy, whereas the other ones would have, would can be having full pulpectomy if needed. These decisions are going to have to be triaged and have to be made on the spot on a given tooth as I mentioned on a given root in a given patient there is no formula that comes based on your full understanding all right it took a little bit longer than I wanted to do but I wanted to kind of bring up these two important issues of necrosis as well as these root sparing procedures that I think are interesting and I've done a bunch of and I will share with you in the future with that I think I'm going to go ahead and show you just a case of this kind of a vital pulp therapy in the case of a couple of maxillary teeth so I'm going to share that with you next
All right, it looks like we had to take a detour here from the last little segment. All right, let me go inside so I can explain to you somewhere a little bit quieter what happened. Oh God, it's sweltering hot out here. Okay, so following our detour here in Southern Florida, I am in my little hotel room in uh, Key Biscayne and I figured I'll just talk to you about this clinical case that can illustrate some of the concepts we talked about in terms of vital pulp therapy. So the tooth that I have for you, actually the teeth that I have for you are this patient with an approximal decay between the first and the second maxillary molars. And as you can see, the decay is fairly deep. So this patient was actually referred for an endodontic therapy on both teeth. However, upon examination and proper diagnostic tests, including the cold sensibility tests and the percussion pulp palpation and various types of pulp vitality tests, we made a determination that the pulp is exhibiting very early stages of uh, irreversible pulpitis. In fact, it was there was not much of a lingering response to cold, so you can call this very early pulpitis uh, stage, although the decay the seems to be right into the pulp and almost radiographically appearing, telltale sign for the requirement for root canal therapy, we decided to go in there and find out what we're doing by first doing proper caries control and in these types of cases the key is to have proper isolation and you can treat one tooth at a time in this particular case what I decided to do is to remove the decay on the first molar and then control the bleeding these times you can do an approximately by application of some epinephrine through injection into the coal area and then controlling it with some type of a heat as well heat cutter or even electric cutter but you need to have a very clean dentin by the time you reach the area around the pulp so that you can remove the rest of all the decay, making sure that you've removed the decay. In this particular case, there is a pulpal exposure. And so I'll show that a little bit better here on this tooth and the other molar. As after removal of all the decay, we apply the um, a cotton pellet with sodium hypochlorite in there. In this particular case, I actually used Triton, but you could use regular hypochlorite at concentrations ranging anywhere from 1% to 2% to even actually in the literature, you could even use full strength hypochlorite as well. The goal here is to disinfect further and then achieve hemostasis. Once you achieve hemostasis and you have a dry field, what you would do next is to apply the uh, bioceramic and we're applying a pure bioceramic. In this particular case, I put on just the, a dab of uh, the BC sealer. You could use the BC RRM syringable or you could, if you prefer, you could use the putty material. Now, once this has been done, now the goal is to then put something on top of this and here I'm using the BC liner using the tooth collar BC liner as we did in both of these teeth following the hemostasis and application of the BC sealer I've filled both of the teeth up in bulk with BC liner and uh, as you can see here uh, we did use a little bit of a matrix band to just allow ourselves better control in the interproximal area between these two teeth and filled both of them up uh, bulk with the BC liner the key here is to make sure that you are using an orange filter so they use from your operatory and your microscope do not initiate premature setting of the BC liner. So it allows itself and self bonding to take place. And afterwards here, you can see that both teeth have been repaired with the BC sealer or the pure bioceramic against the areas where the pulpal exposures occurred in both of these teeth. And then they are followed up with the placement of the BC liner. Two very quick procedures to do this type of almost caries control procedure, which previously we used to do with calcium hydroxide and IRM, you can now do with a pure your bioceramic followed by the placement of this material BC liner. It's been optimized to work with a bioceramic and that allows you to do a very quick caries control. You can do this in teeth with multiple quadrants or quadrants caries controls in patients that are very caries prone by doing this procedure. And then in this particular case, uh, we waited eight weeks and since the symptoms resolved and there was no symptoms anymore at this point, the patient, we retested for vitality, make sure the teeth remained vital. And uh, we do that with just the application of cold, making sure the patient feels it listening also to the patient's history and then we use these um, the liner as a base by drilling into it a couple millimeters and filling up on top of that with final 
composite or sort of material. Now, I would actually recommend the use of the blue BC liner in this particular case because it would be a little bit easier to visualize later on when you want to drill into it. So don't use a tooth collar one, use the blue BC liner because you can drill into it, use it as base, and then place your final sort of material. So this is it, this is the case I wanted to show you. These cases work well when you've done proper diagnostics and then you actually remove uh, all of the decay, even if it means carries uh, carries exposure. That can only happen if you have proper isolation and control of microbial contamination of the pulp and then do your direct pulp capping with a pure biceramic followed by a uh, restorative material on top of that. In this particular case, BC sealer and the BC liner on top of that. All right, guys, coming to you from Key Biscayne, Florida here, a little island off of Miami. I hope you enjoyed this second portion of the Vital Pulp Therapy, and I look forward to your comments below in terms of what your ideas are. I will be sharing a lot more cases in this particular area, which I'm hoping to share with you in the future. For everyone then know, I'm Ali Nese, and until next time, let's save some teeth.